Hello, people, think tech. This is Quad Talk. I'm Crystal, still here in Hong Kong and Asia, and still trying to navigate some very important issues around Asia and why that's important to the globe and to Hawaii and everything. So let's talk about binary spaces, okay? Let's face it. Um, the world is still a very binary place. Um, we see things in black and white. We don't like to muddle in between spaces. And so we need to think about why this is such an uncomfortable topic. So today we're going to talk about gender issues. And I have uh, my wonderful guest here to talk about being trans in Asia, which just sounds like, you know, it's a loaded, layered uh, topic that we need to unpeel because there's the identity, the cultural issues, the transnational aspects of movement to different places and what it means um, as a body um, and, and identity in a place that is restricted by so many patriarchal and, and masculine and heteronormative controls. So here we have, I have Brenda here with me. She's a lecturer at the Hong Kong University. Let me introduce her properly. Uh, Brenda earned her, her BS, MA, and PhD in all psychology at the University of Santo Tomas, and her research interests are mainly on LGBTQ experiences and narratives. Brenda teaches in the Gender Studies program at the University of Hong Kong. She's always been among the most visible queer activists in Hong Kong, the Philippines, and globally, and has appeared on TV and radio. Her research work and publication is mostly on exploring the trans identities using interdisciplinary approaches. And she is on the executive board of the ILGA Asia and ILGA World, and currently the Society of Transsexual Women of the Philippines. So a warm welcome to Brenda here on Think Tech. Hi, Brenda. Hello, Mabu. Hi. Thank you, Crystal, and everyone at Think Tech. Um, hello to everyone in Hawaii and everyone watching us beyond. And thank you for having me. It's it's such an honor. My first time, and I'm very happy yeah. to talk. And it's really um, a privilege of mine to speak to you here in Asia. We're both here, we're both Asian, but we're both kind of transnational people navigating academic spaces and trying to be visible to create voices for, you know, communities that need to be heard, right? So let's talk about you personally first, and then we can talk about your work. Um, tell us where you grew up and why you ended up in Hong Kong. Um, so I was born in the Philippines. Uh, I was born in uh, Samar. So it's one of those islands in the Visayan region of the Philippines. Um, and then I grew up in Manila. Um, uh, the Philippines is predominantly a Christian or Catholic uh, country. So I was baptized. I was raised Catholic. It's quite conservative, uh, but quite open. Um, no, I wouldn't say open, but very tolerant towards LGBTQ people, but uh, still very conservative. Um, and um, the first time that I learned about uh, being trans, well, actually, um, the first time I identified as a girl, I remember, was I was five or six years old. And we didn't really have the language of trans, you know, or LGBT. When I was growing, growing up, we didn't really use um, these acronyms. But I knew as young as I was back then that I am a girl because I was assigned um, male at birth or I was assumed or assigned male at birth. So um, that's, that's, and I'm quite out about that for a long time, you know. I mean, like for our um, viewers or listeners, I would like them to also know that not all trans people are out and that not all uh, LGBTQI people want to come out. But in my case, I kind of gotten used to coming out as trans. Is so the support of your family to feel comfortable enough to out yourself or what was it? Partly, yes, that's true, because I, I guess I would be very fortunate uh, because my family, my, my parents in particular, uh, um, were very accepting Well, when they were still alive. Unfortunately, my dad passed away about five years ago, um, and then my mom passed away um, uh, almost 12 years ago, um, or more than 12 years ago, rather. Yeah, and um, I think the ones who had a difficulty really accepting me for who I am where some of the people surrounding my my parents um some 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 extended family members and a few neighbors you know some of my teachers in primary school secondary school and university um yeah it, it's not been easy um and I think because of the Catholic upbringing you know um 
because uh, like when we go to mass, we have this portion of the mass called the homily. And every now and then, uh, some of the homily of the priest would normally um, cause like a stigma towards LGBTQI yeah. people, you know, and it, that kind of swing my, my parents every now and then. I think my, my parents have been very accepting of me. Yeah, you're lucky for that. I mean, because societal pressures you see it all over the world, right, are a big factor in, in, in having trans people or non-binary individuals um, internalizing and also causing deep, deep mental issues because of that lack of being able to express yourself, right? So going forward, when you were like um, growing up as, you know, when your sexuality was budding, so to speak, you know, teenager life, were you dating? Did you, did you, were you attracted to certain types of genders or like, how did that inform again, your space and your identity? Um, when I talk about my gender and my sexuality, I tend to use the Superman and Wonder Woman analogy. <laughs> Um, especially when I talk about it with, uh, uh, with kids, uh, I'd say that I first discover being Wonder Woman. Um, when I was growing up, the live action version of Linda Carter's Wonder Woman was quite popular. I love and you, Wonder Woman. I, 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 my favorite is superhero. Yes. And then so uh, at five, at five or six years old, uh, I really gravitated towards her. I feel like Wonder Woman and my mom or my, my mother they were like my role models as women. And I wanted to be uh, that kind of woman, like my mom, like Wonder Woman. But about a couple of years after that, I, maybe when I was seven or eight years old, I, I remember watching the live action version of Superman with Christopher Reeve as the main actor. Um, and he was like my first crush. So Christopher Reeve as Superman was my first crush. So that's how I discovered my sexuality as well. So I, I think I discovered my gender identity earlier than my sexuality later on because it, it's quite important for me to make that distinction in the Philippines because back home, they tend to um, conflate sexuality and gender. They think that I think of myself as a girl because I like guys, but it's not necessarily the case. So trans women can can like any anyone. You know, there are straight exactly. trans women, there are lesbians among us. Uh, but they're also non, uh, non-sexual non among us. But in my case, I'm a straight trans woman. Um, and Superman's, uh, Christopher Reeve's version kind of uh, awakened that in me. So uh, for the longest time, I've been attracted to men, including trans men, some transgender men. Um, and um, I would date, you know. Um, I'm not dating currently, but I would I would date but, yeah. back in the day. Back in the day, <laughs> okay. Well, don't make it yeah, it's been a long time. time. You know, okay, so you've been back in Hong, you've moved to Hong Kong, and I just want to uh, address that people who don't know the kind of the nuances between the different Asian cultures here in Hong Kong, there is a quite strong coded discriminating um, hierarchy, if you agree with me, right, on the color line in terms of the um, anti kind of like, th- there is a there's a very negative perception, uh, or at least a class distinction between people from Southeast Asia and South Asia from the East yeah. Asians. Also because yeah. of the economic relationship, right? A lot of the Hong Kong um, family households um, have a domestic helper who tends to be either from the Philippines or Indonesia and all these places. And so there is this really kind of an awkward uh, discriminating relationship. And so when you come here and you're, you know, you're an academics, but you're also seen as a Filipino woman, you know, how did you, how did that affect you coming here? Initially, I was very excited. So it was 2011, um, and I was. I, it was my first time out of the country. Actually, it was a. It, uh, it's kind of weird as well because it's the first time I boarded a plane. It's a. It's a, It was my first time on a plane and out of the country, and I was quite excited. But when I landed on the airport, I remember that. Um, so there was like a, a ground attendant. Uh, uh, at the Hong Kong International Airport. And she was kind of assisting our new arrivals. And then to so anyone that she identify as Filipinas, um, she's going to have this quite condescending tone to pull us towards a particular line because there is a line towards a Filipina domestic worker. So I think she, she kind of assumed if I was a, a domestic worker. And then I said, um, I have a particular visa. Um, do I stay in the same line? And then she, her tone kind of changed. Uh, it kind of went a little lighter. 
So I think in terms of maybe it's in, uh, ethnic identi uh, identification or colorism, maybe she have identified me as from one particular group of, of Southeast Asians, Filipinas to be in particular. But I, I just felt that there was a, sh a shift, you know, when it comes to the kind of work that I'll be doing since I, I, I was about to start being a teaching assistant back then. And then everybody, all the other Filipinas in the same line were, were uh, about to begin working as domestic workers. So it was an eye opener for me. And I realized that I think there is uh, racism or there is that class distinction, um, a separation and hierarchy realities here in Hong Kong. And I have to prepare myself for that. Exactly. And sometimes you don't really know how to prepare yourself for situations like that. And not all, you, you have this double burden of being in a new place, in a place that people have a tendency to look down on on people from the Philippines. And on top of that, you have the gender issue where people go, wait, what? What are you? And how did, you know, so how did Hong Kong people, how, what do you, how did Hong Kong treat you as a trans woman then? Um, I had this funny story because um, the thing is, it's not the same every day. And let's just say that, um, I don't know if it, if, 75% or 80%. So between 70 to 80% of the time, um, it would be like a re very ordinary, regular day whereby nobody notices, nobody assumes what my gender is. Um, nobody tries to figure me out. But beyond that, so let's just say the 20 to 30% over the past 12 years, it's been quite uh, weird, funny, and um, curious. Like, I would remember one time I was uh, I was on the MTR. That was a very, very long time ago. Um, and uh, there was this couple, a, a very young couple, I think, because they are very affectionate towards each other. Maybe they were local, in the first. Local Chinese? Lo I think okay. local Chinese, yeah. Okay. So they were seated in front of me. And then the I think the girlfriends, if, if she was a girlfriend, she was really so intent at looking at me from head to toe. So I think she, and then she would whisper to her boyfriend every now and then, and maybe she was, I couldn't help but assume that she's trying to figure out why I was quite androgynous looking. Right. And then so I thought I might, I thought I'd rather give them a dose of their own medicine. So I started looking at them. I was staring at them and then they felt really conscious. And then I wasn't so sure if they were supposed to get off at uh, the TSD station, Tsim Sha Tsui station. So they were rushing out of Tsim Sha Tsui station. And then I continued staring at them from inside the train and then they were already running away. And then they looked back and then they realized I was still looking at them and then they were dashing off, you know. So that, that, that was quite a funny experience. I would even share that with some friends. And I think that, that, that the lesson there is when, they, when some of the locals or maybe um, um, some Chinese um, uh, people would not be so used to seeing someone quite androgynous looking, they tried to figure them out. Yeah. Another experience was when I was standing on the train as well, it was quite full. Um, nobody was paying attention to me that much, so to speak. It wasn't, I wasn't drawing attention. Incidentally, I have two friends who are also trans, quite tall as well. And um, so they, they, they uh, came in in uh, about a couple of stations after. And then so when we met, we started saying hi, hello to each other, and then we were chatting. And then all of a sudden, uh, a group of um, um, women were, were whispering towards each other and then looking at our necks, looking at our hands and feet. And then we realized, I think they're dissecting our bodies because they were trying to confirm if we are indeed feminine. So that's another example. And there were a few of those other kinds of experiences in between. So but not too many, but they're quite. But can you so, ever get used to that? To feel like you're the object of somebody's gaze? To be objectified in that way that's trying to figure you out and pointing out, you know, just the, the pure kind of the question of sexuality and why you always have to be burdened with that in your everyday living in Asia? I never get, yeah, I, I think I'd never get used to it. But because of the experience, uh, I'm trying to compartmentalize my, my, my experience, you know, so because um, it, it will be even harder to confront them about it. I'm not the confrontative type always. I remember back in the Philippines when something like that happens, I can somehow get away, you know, with, with engaging them in conversations. But this time it's different, especially even if I've been living here for 12 years. Unfortunately, yeah. I don't speak Cantonese or Mandarin. So yeah. it yeah, can still be a chance. Right. Yeah. So you talk I realize you yeah. never get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and, and that's very unfortunate, but maybe it's because of the, um, the lack of voices. Uh, yeah. Right. 
we, we need to normalize and talk about it. And so when people hear our interview, for example, they get to know you as a person as opposed to seeing you as just a body. And I think that this is perpetuated by media and, and a lot of conversations within families and society. But let's talk about Hong Kong society and, and again, the trans visibility there, because apparently there is this big Hong Kong um, LGBT games going on right now. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Which is, this, uh, it's historical, isn't it? It is. So the gay games has been around for about 40 years already. And it's the first time that Hong Kong and actually Asia is hosting it. Um, it's co-hosted with uh, Guadalajara. So um, it, it would have happened, um, I think, last year. But because of the, the pandemic, they had to push back for another year. So it's really a huge event, you know. And I think, but one challenge that it poses would be, like, for example, I know that you you may have heard of issues um, surrounding trans women uh, and sport and intersex yeah. people and yeah. sport. So that's, that's still a challenge, you know, thinking that uh, gay games is supposed to be LGBTQ inclusive. Um, I think they're still figuring out how they can make gay games non-binary, so to speak, very fluid, you know, across genders and sexuality. So it's still a, a, a growing conversation, even within the LGBTQ space. But another issue is uh, administrative as well as uh, um, um, social, because a, a lot of um, trans and intersex and non-binary people from across the globe will be uh, coming over to Hong Kong to watch and participate. And the thing is, like what you also mentioned earlier, that there's this lack of visibility. Even if we were, we are visible, we are quite invisible also to the eyes of um, local and Chinese um, el um, um, society. So because of that, when they see six foot tall or past six foot tall, Pa'afa Fines from Samoa, you know, we're wearing flowers uh, at the side of their uh, ears, you know, and then looking like women, but at the same time looking quite androgynous in their eyes, everyone's going to wonder when they see muscular uh, trans women that they will automatically assume to be not women, yeah. you know, or in their words, not right. real, quote unquote, women, then it's going to be a challenge, you know, like uh, it's not just the immigration uh, uh, point at the, at the airport, but it'll also be like the, the toilets, the, the changing rooms across the city. So it's, 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 it's a curious situation. Hopefully nothing uh, untoward happens to any of, of, of trans and non-binary and intersex people yeah. in the duration, but it would have it would have been an opportunity to be to bring us greater visibility in terms of not just transness and otherness, but also in terms of race, ethnicity, and color and experience. I and agree. Agree. Uh, you know, being in Hong Kong and being a you know mostly global, very international cosmopolitan city. We have the diversity of, 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 of different groups here, but at the same time, because of the colonial past, there's been kind of a, a strong, heavy influence of this um, white supremacist kind of backdrop of this Eurocentric way of thinking about things, right? Even though it's yeah. switched to China now, I don't know if you feel that way, but it's still that past has really influenced the way um, this society works in terms of how we navigate different ethnic groups. Yeah. And it's also the, the way that uh, like trans activists or advocates uh, and academics are now also pushing for decolonizing gender studies, decolonizing um, LGBTQI narratives. Um, like, for example, as a trans woman, um, the, the, the overarching narrative towards trans people is that there is this medical model towards being trans that we have to follow. So everybody around us, you know, like if not here in Hong Kong, um, in the Philippines, we get asked questions. And I know my Thai, my friends from Thailand also have similar experience. We get asked medical related questions like, do we have real breasts? Are the breasts that, that we show real or are they fake? Or when do we plan to have um, surgeries? When do we have to, uh, to plan? When do we plan to have a lower surgeries, genital surgeries, you know? Um, Why uh, do we your identity based on these physical traits from medical um, intrusions of <laughs> yeah yeah they they even they even ask us uh, they even they even ask us um, a very intrusive question such as do you plan to have voice lessons so that your voice will sound more feminine you know so every now and then we get those and because of that I, I think it has also caused some form of a social collective insecurity to, uh, amongst us trans women you know like um uh, in Thailand and in the Philippines, there's this wave of um, trans beauty pageant 
um, trans girls that we constantly join beauty pageants, whereby we we would have a black market or those quick um, um, medical procedures that, to have fillers in our faces and in our bodies to conform to those expectations. And I think that has also taken away from the very unique approach, you know, towards our natural and, self. And it also reinforces the whole idea of feminine, right? Yeah. It's, it's reinforcing yeah. kind of this, the, the heteronormative way of defining a woman. It's yeah. so ironic. And in fact, um, because of that, uh, I have a very dear friend back in the Philippines, and uh, she was also an, an iconic uh, beauty queen back home many years ago. She, she passed away. She died because of this kind of pressure. She's already very beautiful, but because of this kind of uh, uh, pressure, you know, to look more feminine, quote unquote, you know, based on the standards of society towards trans women, um, she succumbed to um, a medical um, I, I forgot what this egg, egg, the exact uh, diagnosis was, but because of the collagen and the silicone that was injected in her face and in her body, and she happened to have um, some pre-existing medical conditions, one of which is asthma, she didn't make it. You know, she, she died upon the administration of those procedures. And that happens every now and then to some trans people. And the other thing that I'd like to mention is that in Asia, most of the countries in Asia don't have gender recognition laws. Um, and it's very important for us to have gender recognition laws, anti-discrimination laws, and also a, a, even same-sex union or equality union laws because those are ways for trans people, non-binary people to, to be protected, you know, and uh, in, in such oppressive um, spaces. Um, Can you like, clarify which Asian countries do have? Yeah. And which uh, are more severe? Yes. I mean, India... Um, they, they do have a uh, gender recognition. So the third gender people here trust are recognized. So incidentally, the problem that they're facing now is towards same sex union. So it's towards, um, same sex right. and there's, uh, right. the, you know, yeah. And Nepal also have, um, gender recognition. Um, but I think there are particular guidelines in their gender recognition that they're still struggling with. We don't have that in Hong Kong yet, but we have what we call those court cases, the court victories. So we have the, the Henry uh, Seth case that was a victory early this year to, to be able to change gender markers in the Hong Kong ID and names without the poor same surgeries. But the implementing rules and regulations are yet to be um, clear, you know, um, that's uh, pending. Uh, in the Philippines, we don't have um, all of those laws across the board, you know, and, they, and they, they seem that the Philippines is quite open to LGBT culture. But we don't have those laws. We don't have gender recognition. We don't even have anti-discrimination. Yeah. And yeah. the legislators in the Philippines in particular are using um, the, their religious fundamentalist uh, beliefs, you know, to, to hinder anti-discrimination protections. In yeah. Indonesia and in Malaysia, it can even be worse because there are also some religious extremists, you know, some Islam yeah, extremists. And torture and, yeah. 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 Actually, very by um, body has been um, and and I want to say it also in the states because the, the movement towards the control over a body is just out of control now, and it's just what is this saying about our world and our kind of almost the reversal of this um, the freedom to to claim our own bodies and and what is it for our responsibility and you as an academic what can you do to kind of help. Um, change these narratives and to bring visibility to these issues so that we can have a different way of looking at, at, at bodies. I think uh, um, this opportunity you gave me is one example. So whenever um, other podcasts or shows like this that gives us a platform to, to show our, our unique voices and to also talk about uh, our stories, all the good and the bad of it, it's a platform of visibility for us. Um, companies, um, should continue to really uh, walk the talk, oh, walk the talk, you know, uh, when it, because isn't it, um, they have what they call the DEI, the diversity, in, equ uh, equality, and uh, inclusion practice. Now, if they truly have that, hopefully they will continue to push uh, diversity, equality, equitability, and inclusion, and make sure that their policies are very inclusive, their spaces are inclusive. Schools should definitely do the same. You know, the, they just it usually begins in the school, uh, schools, and you know when schools here in Hong Kong and in 
the Philippines, among other countries in Asia, have such restrictive and binary practices, you know, like yeah. this, the yeah. prescription of haircut and uniforms. That can already cause a, a well-being and mental health issue for a young, queer, and trans kid. So but we have to talk about hand, Brenda. Sorry. Um, you know, there is, and I don't think this is just um, any kind of like localized issue, but the trend for a lot of the younger generation, for my example, my daughter's generation, they all have this very non-binary way of looking at things in that they don't see gender as an issue. But then yeah. they have this kind of um, communication problem with the older generation because um, my generation, growing up, we, we grew up in a binary world, so we don't really understand and we're still struggling with the terms and the kind yeah. of the, the spectrum of identities. And so how do we kind of bring these two together, whereas the lower, younger generation have this extreme um, free-for-all thoughts so we can do anything with our bodies we're entitled to, and yet the, there is this larger force that's still trying to keep control over us. And so how are we going to bring mm -hmm. it in, in our short I, time? I think, I think our audience should always remember that uh, we live in a world of diversity, and part of that is gender and sexual diversity, even bodily diversity. That's why intersex people are who and what they are because they were born that way. And we also have to decolonize our beliefs when it comes to um, um, the binary and shift that towards non-binary because I think we've lived in more uh, gender progressive and gender transgressive societies before. Uh, so we can bring that back. And then we can just listen to like what you mentioned, you know, I mean like the generation today, the kids today, they have the language towards their identities. They're kind of living their truth but because our generation and those who came before us are the ones enforcing the policies and practice, that's where the discord is still, you know. So they know that uh, they know the truth is out there already, and they have they can talk to each other. You know, the social media reality has also allowed them to reach out to each other and become a community. And so it's a struggle for them. So I think our generation and those that came before us should should listen, you know, because if. We have been um, um, calling out everyone's attention for a long time. So now we, we should continue to listen to this generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you for that because we really need to hear it. And I think that what you're doing is so important. Uh, the gender studies department at the Hong Kong University is so important because it does. And it's not just attracting people who are non-binary to identify. It's for people from all, all spectrums of life to be able to come together to talk about this in a normalized way to celebrate us as human beings and to respect each other and our, each other's bodies. So thank you so much, Brenda, for all your um, input and sharing and I appreciate all the work you do. And I know you're gonna be doing a lot to break the mold. So thank you for breaking boundaries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal and everyone. Think back. Thank you.